morning. Uh, I invite us to please uh, stand as we uh, come together in the presence of the Lord to worship him. Uh, and let's pray together. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just give you all the glory, honors, and praise because you are faithful, you are just, and you uh, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, and it's just by you and you alone and your faithfulness to us that you um, do that. As we come into this place, that you would, uh, that you would uh, just come in power, come in glory, uh, that you are awesome, um, an awesome God uh, who is gracious uh, to each and every one of us, and your people. And we just give you all the glory, honor, and praise as we come to worship and worship you and you alone in this place. And we thank you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises.
Father, we uh, truly are grateful to you uh, for your grace and your glory. And Heavenly Father, as we come into this place today, that we can just sing, worship, and give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And everything and all of it belongs to you. As your grace is so amazing that you draw us to you. You bring us into your presence. That you are the one who changes lives and empowers us to be able to go boldly into the world to declare your holy name. We want to declare that at this place and this time and lift your holy name and give you all the glory, honor, and praise. So give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Sing amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. My chains are gone. 
has promised good to me.
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. pray. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, you are our way maker. You are the one who makes a way. That you uh, take all the things that are worthless and make it worthy. Uh, You are the one who takes simple people like you and me and are able to do miraculous things with them. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, give you all the praise and glory that you are the one who gives grace and hope and purpose to your people. And we just want to give you all the glory, praise, and honor here today. We just thank you and give you praise. Give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, if you can take a moment to please uh, welcome the people around you and say hi. And I love you in the Lord. All right, um, we are continuing our series uh, titled The Anointing, and the subject I want to talk about is grace, Um, what I call the most misunderstood word in the Christian world today. I think it's it's a flawed understanding because I think we want to go to dictionary and we want to just look up the word grace. Of course, it says unmerited favor, favor we don't deserve, and I think we, we don't look at the whole biblical definition of the word grace. And, uh, and because of that, I think we miss out on God's power. Because when you study the Bible, Paul will say that I work harder than all the other apostles, but not I, but the grace of God. Right? He's not saying, oh, I, I, I receive unmerit. No, he's saying it's the power of God that's in us. And because we under- misunderstand this definition of grace, I don't think we understand that we can use this power to transform not only our lives, but the world. In fact, 
This context here, we're talking about anointing upon the church. And I told you anointing is Holy Spirit endowment. It's the same thing as being filled with the Spirit. We can, be, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, which is independent, being independent of God, the Holy Spirit. And we can be filled with the Spirit, which means to be controlled by the Spirit. Anointing is just another word of endowment of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things we learn as we open up to chapter 2 is that if we have the right definition of uh, the word grace, we can use God's power of grace to find God's anointing. And the anointing that God gives us, God gives us through uh, the discipline. It's, it's a means of grace because something that when Paul is talking about in the book of Ephesians, he's, talk, he's telling the church not only that they have received grace, but that they can practice grace. The discipline of grace. It's, it's something that you practice towards people. And we've been talking about anointing, right? We get anointing through praise. We get anointing through prayer, right? Part one and two, vertical relationship. Now he's talking about horizontal relationship. We get anointing by practicing the discipline of grace with one another. And listen to what he says. It's really amazing. Chapter two, verse one, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of the world and rulers of the kingdom of the air, spirit who is now at work with those who are disobedient. All of us who live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us live with Christ even when we're dead in our transgressions. And then he's going to repeat, he's going to repeat this, right? It is by grace. Right? He's talking about much more than just the favor. He's talking about power that you received. In fact, he's talking much more than just power you received. He is telling the church, right, from chapter 1 to chapter 3 of book of Ephesians, he's talking about the anointing that we receive through these disciplines to build God's church. And then when we build God's church, it becomes unified and mature, and it's anointed, it's fullness of God, so we can serve God's purpose. So he goes on, it is by grace that you have been saved. You receive God's power, and God raised us up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus, for it is by grace. You see, he repeats it. It is by grace. It's not because he, he believes that the Ephesians don't understand that they've known. He's telling the Ephesians, not only have you received God's favor, you've received God's power, and you have to understand that you need to practice the discipline of grace within the church because your church is a people full of imperfections and in the church if church loses its grace the practice it doesn't practice what i call the discipline of grace we're no different than the world church is full of flawed, flawed people and when people walk in people want grace to be practiced upon them but if everyone in the church practices great they become witness to this world that's why he repeats this it is by grace you have received this faith this this salvation right and God raised us up with Christ and seated him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It is by grace, see, right? Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Actually, you can translate that word faith to faithfulness. In the Greek, you can actually say it's faithful. Well, it's obviously not our faithfulness. It's Christ's faithfulness. So it depends on how you, how you think of God's sovereignty. If you think God's sovereignty overrides your personal uh, decision, then you can look at this as Christ's faithfulness, okay? Christ's faithfulness that gives you faith, okay, to believe. But if you think God's sovereignty is independent of our human responsibility, you can just say Christ's faithfulness responds our demands, our dem uh, uh, gives us the response to respond in faith. Either way, you look at it, the, all the work is done by Christ and Christ alone. All right? And then, so he says, not by works so that no one can boast. Very significant. Right? Because even when we practice grace, one of the anointings that we get from practicing grace is that it's not of ourselves. In other words, you cannot practice the discipline of grace in your own strength. And then he says, for we are God's handiwork or workmanship. Right? Created in Christ Jesus to do good work which God prepared in advance for us to do. And you understand this. We've been studying about chapter 1. Before the creation of the world, he chose us. All right? Before the creation of the world, he chose us in his sovereignty. So this handiwork, God's workmanship, this good work, right, good work, is something that God already prepared for us to do. 
And I think it's the practice of the discipline of grace. So today, as we study Apostle Paul encouraging us to realize the anointing of grace, I'm going to answer three questions that's going to help us to practice the discipline of grace. So we're talking about anointings, Holy Spirit endowment, right? This empowerment that God, God gives us. So we have to ask this question, what kind of anointing does the discipline of grace bring? And right away, as you open up, Paul wants to state in the first three verses that we get an anointing of change, you know, the anointing of power. Do you notice? Because he's going to contrast verse 1 to verse 4. Verse 2 to verse 5, he's going to contrast this. Notice this, it's really cool. And what he's reminding the uh, uh, Ephesians is they have changed. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, as for you, you were dead, right? You're dead in your transgression. But then he contrasts this in verse 5, right? He, Christ, God has made us alive with Christ. Okay, there's the contrast, right? He's talking about change. He does it again in verse 2. He says, in which you used to live following the ways of the world and the rulers of the kingdom of the air. You are bound by the world. You follow the ways of the world and then there is a prince of demons, Satan himself, who binds you. You used to live this way. Okay, the spirit who is now working who are disobedient. But then you notice verse 5. He made us live with Christ. We're dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. He didn't only awaken us, but then he raised us up. We're free. With Christ. We're seated at the highest authority with Christ. No one can control us. No one can bind us other than Christ himself. And seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Again, you see this in verse 3. It says, we were objects of wrath. Notice what it says. All of us, this is before we met Christ, live among them at one time. Gratifying the cravings of flesh. Following the desires and thoughts. We, like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. But then he contrasts this in verse 6 and 7. He says, and God raised us with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness. Do you notice? We're objects of wrath, but now we are objects of his kindness. In fact, at end times, through God's grace, we're going to receive this grace. He's talking about anointing. And he's not only talking about what happened. All of these are in past tense in the sense that God gave us grace to save us, made us alive. He empowered us. He set us free. He gave us freedom, right? He enabled us to live for him. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not only talking about that. He's not talking about receiving unmerited favor. He's talking about the power that you have in Christ. And the power that you have if you practice the discipline of grace is that when you practice it, God gives you this anointing of change, ability to change people through God. That's what he's talking about. It's amazing. He's saying you have the power. You have the power. If you practice, God will anoint you. God will fill you with your spirit. God will enable you to do that which you cannot do. And the first kind of anointing, the uh, uh, Holy Spirit power that you get is what I call anointing of change. And then there's anointing of gratitude. Notice what he says. He's going to repeat this, right? I just said this, verse 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This not from yourself is a gift of God. So obviously he wants what? He wants the Ephesians to know, and the churches around it, or any believers to know that they are to have gratitude, right? He repeats this in verse 5, right? Made us alive, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression. And then he says, it is by grace you have been saved. But he's talking not only about receiving grace, he's talk, also talking about practicing grace. And we know, right? We understand it, right? We got grace because we didn't deserve it, and because of that we should be grateful. But when you are about to practice grace, you know right away you can't do it. It's no accident when you look at the world, they're talking about social justice. Everybody's talking about justice. Do you know why? Because that's natural. And when you, when you walk into the church and people don't treat you the way you want to be treated, yeah, you think about justice and you talk about bitterness, you want to get back at them. And the unfortunate thing is because most people are like, I want to be in a perfect church, right? And what I always tell you, don't go there, you'll make it imperfect, right? What happens? Everybody's a sinner, everybody hurts you, everybody, nobody is perfect and it frustrates you. And one of the questions you raise is, how can I find the right church? I was in Discipleship 300 with the group, and one of the questions one of the guys was asking me is, uh, what do I do if a church doesn't believe in the Word of God? I said, I think in that case, it's, it's very hard for you to go there, right? Because there's no objective standard, and it's over, right? But we ask these questions, well, this, this place, it's not perfect. They're not loving me. They're, they're hurting me, right? So automatically, you get this question. But what Paul is talking about is this. You didn't deserve it. You received it. Therefore, you have salvation. In fact, when you practice this grace that you, you, you got undeservingly, this power of God to resurrect you. When you practice it, what he's saying is that you're going to depend upon God and you're going to have a grateful heart. I, I need you to get this, okay? 
Because people are like, well, I want justice. That person has hurt me. It makes me feel better to hurt them. But notice what he's saying, okay? He's saying it is by grace that you have your salvation. It is by faith. Even the faith doesn't even come from you. What he's really reminding you is that how you can have gratefulness. I know some of you are like, well, if somebody, you hurt me, I hurt you, and I'm going to get it. That's how I'm going to feel good. What he's saying something else. He's talking about anointing of gratitude. He's saying, no, 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 you just do the opposite. And of course the question is why. I don't know why people always have to ask why. Of course the question is why. Why should I do? Because you will have anointing of gratitude. In other words, as you're practicing, as you're loving people who do not deserve to be loved, as you are giving grace to people and practicing the discipline of grace with the people that do not deserve it, you're going to have this attitude, attitude, anointing of gratitude. Why? Because you understand it as you're practicing it. It is God who's doing it for you. I was talking about this lady. I've done ministry for almost 30 years, so I kind of understand this. I remember once, uh, this many years ago, I planted a church at 31, so I've, and I planted many different churches, so I have this experience. I remember I was commenting on this one lady, and uh, she looked very tired. She was a young lady, and I said, oh, how are you doing? Uh, you seem very tired. And I remember she got upset. And I didn't preach that day, luckily. And she looked at me, and she said, how many times did I tell you never to comment on women's appearance? The answer was, you never did. But anyways, um, I said, oh, and then I walked back in the back of the church. I didn't preach that day. Man, my back was all sweaty. My legs were shaking. I mean, it affects us. And all I can think about all that week is this person, right? This crazy person. I don't understand. I mean, I'm a pastor. I don't really care. I mean, if you look good, good. If you don't look good, good. I don't really care. If you're like thick, thin, whatever. I don't comment on appearance. It doesn't matter to me. But I do have a right to say, hey, you, you, you look tired. Anyways, it doesn't matter. God, the Holy Spirit, was reminding me, you need to call her, restore her. Didn't want to. In those days, we used to have a flip phone. I would flip it. I get on my knees, and I can't call, so I flip it down. And then I'd be, I try to study, can't do it. You flip it up, and then you flip it down. And then finally, like, I just pressed it, and I was hoping that it wouldn't answer. She answered, and I said, hey, you know, I think we had some issues on Sunday. We should meet, and we should talk. And then she was like, yeah, I, I think there was something. You know, I wasn't in a good place. And then I, I hung up the phone, flipped the phone down, and I cried. <laughs> I mean, there's a part of me. I, it was such injustice, right? What the heck's your problem? But then there's the other part. There's no way I could have done that. I'm an ex-con. I would dealt drugs. You know, I, I know you don't, you don't. I don't look like it, but I've been lifting weights for many, many years. I'm probably one of the stronger Asians. I, when I was younger, I did steroids. I mean, I, you know, and I believe it. Like, when all else fails, use physical force. And, uh, you know, it doesn't work with my wife or my daughter or my son. But, I mean, you know, there was a part of me that was so grateful to God. Because I could have never done it. And it was amazing. Because there's part of me, right, the fleshly side that's so grieving and that's so angry. But the spiritual side that's amazed at the power of grace that's in you. And that's so grateful. Because that's what Paul's talking about. It is by grace you have been saved. This not of yourself. Not by works. It's not justification by works. We don't believe in justification by works. It's by faith. Faith and alone. We're asking a question. What kind of anointing do we receive when we practice grace? And why should we practice grace? We're asking all these questions. Well, this person, well, because you get anointing of gratitude and then you get one more anointing, which is anointing of purpose. Notice here, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork or God's workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for. What's the good work? I see many people, right? Every generation is slightly different. If I can summarize my own generation of Generation X, I think they really wanted to be comfortable. When I look at millennial generation, I'm, again, I'm, I could be wrong. We don't need to have a talk. My, my, my only observation, many millennials, I think their goal is to make a lot of money. I don't know. Maybe I'm different. Maybe you want to change the world, whatever. But that's what I see. But all of us have a goal, right, and a purpose that we move by, right? And then Paul is talking about a purpose that God has created for us to do, right? He said, before the creation of the world, God made you into his handiwork. And he has set the universe in such a way, and he has set a good work. And the, the question we have to answer is, what's the good work? It's grace, the discipline of grace. That's what he's saying. When I look back on that lady who yelled at me, that was the work. Calling her back, that was the work. That transformed her, that transformed me. That's the work. You see, Paul is telling the church, 
This is how you become a witness to this world. It is not by your excellence and your excellent ability to do music, preach, and then present how good you are. Paul's not saying this. I'm going to show you later on book of Acts that he did exactly this. Showed grace when he went to Ephesus to minister. But Paul is showing us here. No, 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 no. There is a purpose that God has created you, and it's to be like him. Just as God gave us his grace, we are to give it. Oh, of course the question is, well, I have no problem giving grace to people that deserve it. Uh, he's not talking about that because he already said it is by faith, not by works. And he repeated it again and again. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. No, you didn't receive it because you deserved it. In fact, there is no justification by works alone. In fact, works at all. That's why I don't believe in any, any idea of a, a salvation that has faith plus works or works because it's just not good enough. God's standard is too high. We can't do it. The whole premise of this is that you cannot. You didn't deserve it. Even the faith that you have is from God. You didn't earn it. God gave it to you. You didn't earn it. He gave it. Even the faith that you have, God gave it to you. And so what he's saying is that, look, and then there's a purpose that God created for you. What is this purpose, God? And it's amazing. And I need you to understand this. I, I meet people and they're always like, what's the purpose of my life? What, 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 what do I need to do? And then do you notice? Whenever you get that which that you need to have a purpose in, do you notice? Do you notice? There's some, it's, it's empty. Right? You ever notice? Like you, you want these things, right? I don't know. Some people want to get married and they get married and then it's empty. And then you want to have kids and you have kids and then it's empty. And then you want kids to go to good school then it's empty. Or you want to get a bigger house. It's empty. You get there and you're like amazed. You're like, what's the purpose? Right? The purpose is just too small. One of my favorite uh, rock bands of all time. Well, I love Genesis and I, I, lo I love Police. And uh, I remember reading about Sting, the lead singer, because, you know, I like Sting because I think he's like 70, but you know, when he was in his late 50s, he still looked good. And uh, I wanted to be like him. You know, I, obviously I can't get there. But, you know, he had hair. He still looked good. And one of the things he said was, when I finally reached stardom and I became a multimillionaire and I had a large house, I wanted to commit suicide. Because he said, I, he said, is this all there is? Right? You see this in sports too. We, 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 we want to win the Super Bowl. And then they win it and they become dissolute. You see this all the time again and again. So one of the things you're asking is, well, wh where do you get this purpose? Well, here it is. Here it is. You were created to be like God, to practice grace, to build God's church, to practice, to give grace to those who doesn't deserve it. And then as you're doing it, because it is so supernatural and it's just like God himself, what he did to us, we get anointing of purpose. Hello, I'd be like, oh, we don't want that. We want to be in control. We want to receive grace, right? When we walk in, we don't, we don't want, we will, uh, right? When I walk in here, I don't know you, right? I want that, right? That's normal, right? We all walk in and you can imagine it. You can walk into a church. I know what everyone's looking for. They want grace. And it makes all the sense to me in the world. I don't know you. You don't know me. Right? It's to make it so much easier if you give me grace, if you love me the way I am, except. And where else can you find it in the church? And you don't even find it. And you're like, oh my gosh. But imagine, imagine if all of us came because we have received grace, right? And we are trying to practice grace and depending upon God because we don't have the power in our own self. And as we're practicing it, I'm sure we practice it poorly. Imagine, imagine, imagine that church full of grace and you're like, oh, this is my purpose. I was built to build something that's not, that doesn't exist. It has to be built spiritually. Yes, you were built as a spiritual stone. You are to be part of a spiritual community. You are the body of Christ. Something that's never been done before, right? The world can do everything better than us, right? They have better organization, better speaker, better singers, better everything. They look better. They lift more weights than we do, right? They got better stretches in the yoga, whatever. You know that. But there's one thing. They didn't receive grace. They don't have the anointing. And because they don't have the anointing of grace, right, they don't have the anointing of purpose. So we're asking the question, what, what kind of anointing do we receive as we practice discipline of grace? There's three kinds of anointing. Anointing of change, anointing of great gratitude, and anointing of purpose. So we do have to answer the question because, you know, some people are like, well, how do, why do we have to practice it, right? I mean, especially, like, it's easy. Like, for me to come up here, I don't know you, you don't know me, and it's easy. We talk about it. But, you know, the minute we get hurt, right, we get disillusioned. We're like, well, you don't understand what I went through. Right? You, you don't know. I mean, we have stories, right? I'm a counselor. Believe me. I have people come into my office tell me all the time about all the pain that they have gone through. And if you, everybody has a story. I told you one of my favorite shows is that Criminal Minds. 
I love reading, you know, watching Criminal Minds, and my wife always, like, makes fun of me, and she says, you know, basically, that's why you're so dark. And I'm like, I'm not dark. <laughs> you know, if you, like, look at all these, like, like serial killers and all, it's amazing. You know, I love that show. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. You ever talk to someone, like, someone who's, like, really bad, not very good, like, you know, I don't know what your standard are. You ever talk to them? Actually, don't even talk to them. Just look in your heart. There's always a reason. Is it not? When we do things, there's always a reason, right? So we have to ask this question, well, why do we want to practice grace? Because there's a reason. Why, why, you know, you don't understand my situation. Let me give you two reasons. One is because, and I've been saying this, so we will be anointed. Now, I need to say this. This is a special kind of anointing. It's not just a regular kind of anointing of like individual anointing, but I'm talking about anointing of witness, what do you mean by witness? I'm talking about church. I told you all of these anointings are not individual anointings. You can get these individually, but I'm not talking about individual anointing. Ephesians is not talking about individual anointing. It's about corporate anointing. So we're like, well, what do you mean anointing? That you're going to be anointed as a witness. Now, I need you to understand something here, okay? When the world sees the church, they don't see much. We're not that big. We're not that great. They, they don't see much. They see ex people just like us. In fact, they would call us exclusive and that we are, you know, bigoted and that we only believe in one way. That's what they see. And one of the questions you ask is, well, how will we, right, witness to this world who is seeing, right, us in such a way? Marginalization, right? Just because, you know, you go out in the world and you start talking about Christian. I was talking to somebody between services and I was saying, hey, you know, if we talk about faith now with people openly, they look at us like we're crazy. If you talk about Jesus is the only way, they judge us. And so one of the questions you're asking is, well, how do we become a witness? So that's, what, that's what I'm talking about, anointing of witness. Well, how do you become? Well, look at verse 7. Paul is reminding us that God has transformed us from object of wrath to object of kindness. Verse 7, in order that we have coming ages, we might show incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness in Christ Jesus. And then he's saying, we, we, we used to be bitter and we used to be outside, but now we're practicing grace and we are grateful. Look at verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We're not boasting, we're practicing, and we are grateful. And then Paul is saying that we're moving with his spirit in the way he wants us to move. So, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus through good work, which God prepared in advance. Do you, do you see what he's saying? Same people as the world who are bound. Same people who used to be dead spiritually. Same people that moved in their own strength and own, own justice. These people receive God's grace. And then they practice it with one another, and then they become a spiritual community, and that becomes a witness. That's what he's saying. If I can just summarize it all, what he's saying is that you cannot be a witness to this world without practicing the discipline of grace. In fact, I was, I was reading the book of Acts when Paul went to Ephesus. In Ephesus, you know, last year I took a team, uh, a mission team to Ephesus, and Ephesus is an amazing city. I went there, I think, three straight years. I was so amazed. They have the library of Celsus, the, the two-story library. It was like lost. It was all like a lost city. And then in like 18, mid 18th, 17th century, 18th, 1870 or something, they found the city. They're still, they're still unpacking all of, these, of the city. And then there's a rich area that they're looking at. Ephesus was like a third richest city. They're still trying to unpack all how the rich people live because there's so many wealthy people. It's amazing. The whole city is made of marble and everything. And Paul was called... As a tent maker to witness there. And you can imagine, he's just nobody, he's just a Jew. Ephesus was a non Jewish city. But because of the grace that he had received, he goes there. In Acts 19, something amazing happens. Acts 19, chapter 1, it says, When Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through interior. And arrived at Ephesus. And then he goes and ministers. He, he practices the discipline of grace. He doesn't need to do it. He does it. He does it. And then all of a sudden, right, there's an anointing of change. Notice, there he found some dis disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. Right? Verse 3, right? We, we asked, you know. Then they, they said, we received John's baptism, right? Right? Verse 4, he says, a John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. Did you notice verse 6? When Paul placed his hand on them, Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues. This is one of the three places in the book of Acts, okay, where the Holy Spirit comes and they speak in tongues. I know some people are like, well, it's another language. Well, you, it doesn't really matter how you interpret it. Yeah, 
the original says another language, but he's talking about and they prophesied. So it's something supernatural happened. He's saying, what he's saying, people that didn't do it are now doing it. And there were 12 men in all of them, right? So there is anointing, right? There is anointing of change and then there's anointing of gratefulness. But do, uh, gratefulness, do you notice in verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively with the kingdom of God, but then some of them become obstinate. You know, they rejected it. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. Did he stop ministering? No, 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 no. He's still grateful. It's amazing. You can actually see this, right? He still had the anointing of gratitude. So he continues to minister. He took the disciples with them and discussion daily in the lecture halls of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And then as he started ministering, there was anointing of purpose. Do you notice what happens? It's amazing, right? Guys, we're asking the question, how do we become a witness well, it's discipline. Notice what happens, verse 11. God did extraordinary, ex extraordinary miracles through Paul. So even his handkerchief and apron had touched him, were taken to the sick, and their illness were cured, and evil spirit left them. You know, just his handkerchief. In other words, they were anointed. God's power was seen. What he's teaching us is this. We're asking, why do we have to practice discipline of grace? Well, obvious, because it will anoint us, and if we are anointed, we will be a witness to this world. I think what God is reminding us is the supernatural and the natural, okay, will happen through pain. NVIDIA became the largest uh, corporation in the world this week. I have some friends that invest in NVIDIA and they're really happy. And uh, I was watching the interview of the CEO of NVIDIA and he was talking about AI and how big these chips were. And one of the questions, he was speaking at uh, Stanford and he was saying, and I was really blown away. He was speaking at Stanford and he was saying, um, the professor asked him, uh, uh, Jensen Huang is his name. He said, um, you know, in, at Stanford, we have many brilliant students. He said, how will you tell them, to, what would you tell them if they are to succeed? And it was amazing. I thought I was in a sermon. Uh, Jensen Huang looked at them. He said, you know, um, at Stanford, there are many uh, gifted and uh, intelligent people. But he said, gifted and intelligent and gifted people do not make great companies. They can make good decisions. They don't make good companies. In order for you to make good company, you need a lot of failure and a lot of pain. He says, at NVIDIA, every year we have such great failure and such great pain. And then he said, the reason why we need great pain and great failure is because that makes our character. And so he said to the students, I wish you a lot of pain and a lot of failure. And everybody laughed and they went home. How do we become a witness to this world? How does a church who is weaker, more marginalized, well, obviously because of a lot of pain and a lot of struggles and because of our, what I call, obvious character flaws that we all bring in because we all have to change, right? God calls us as we are, right? We, people that talk about unconditional love don't know the flip side of it, right? The conditional side, right? In sanctification, God calls us to change, right? God, justification, just as we have not sinned before, right? He justifies us by faith alone. But in sanctification, he makes us holy. The sanctification really means to make holy with God and with ourselves, with an effort. Well, in this context there are many failures so obviously when you go to church there are many people in sanctification that are struggling with their character and what do you not admit the way you change these people is not being bitter at them and being angry at them and yelling at them try it it won't work it's to accept them forgive them care for them and love them just as they had not sinned before well how do we get that power there's no way we can get that power on our own. I don't come from that kind of family. I don't have that kind of, we don't have that power, obviously. So God is giving us the anointing. He's reminding us the anointing of grace. Sometimes you close your eyes, what do you see? What do you see? Do you see Jesus? Do you see his scripture? What do you see? Some of you, you only see is people that have hurt you. Hey, it becomes a focus and then you go into these molds, right? And you're going to get back at them and you're going to keep away from them. And, you know, all of these things like build and you're going to, like, if they did this and you're going to do this, right? 
That's normal. You're like me. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. If people hurt us, we don't go up to them and say we love you. We want to go this way and then go straight around because we don't want to talk to them. You've hurt me. Some of them don't even know that they hurt us, but we don't want to do that. And the scripture is telling us to practice the discipline of grace. And you're like, why? Well, we don't know why. We don't know why if we look in ourselves. But when we look into the scripture, God tells us why. So he will anoint, he will empower us so that we can unify and become a witness to this world. So we're asking, why should we practice, right? Why do we need to practice the discipline? Well, obvious, so that we can be anointed. And second is because we will mature as a church. There's two things that is needed in order for the church of Jesus Christ to be mature, right? We have talked about this. There's two things, right? One is it has to become dependent, Right? And notice here, Paul is reminding us how we see what happens when we receive grace. Notice what he says. It, verse 7, he says, because of great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we're dead in our transgression. Now he's going to repeat the word with again. By grace you have been saved. And in verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him. You, you know, I, I, I think he's trying to say something. I think he's trying to say we are one with Christ. In other words, if we're going to practice it, we have to depend upon him. And you see right away how we will become mature, right? You need to see this. Because some people think if maturity is like total freedom, do what you want. No, no, maturity is complete dependence upon Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 5, Jesus tells his disciples, I am always dependent on my father. We know Jesus is fully God and fully man. So we, the man part is fully showing the world and his disciples what he expects. You want to be spiritually mature, you just to depend. You're like, I can't practice grace because I don't have grace. Precisely. Then I have to depend on precisely, but I don't want to do that. Well, that's a problem. It's a sign of immaturity. You ever notice like if you're bitter at somebody and you don't want to forgive and you, you hide and you isolate, what happens? You don't look to God, what happens? It grows. C.S. Lewis in his book, For Love, says that, you know, some of us don't want to take a chance. We've been hurt too many times. We lock up our hearts. And he says the heart doesn't stay the same. It changes behind that lock. It becomes hardened and hardened and hardened. And in contrast to that, Paul, uh, Paul keeps on saying God raised us with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness in Christ. It's almost as though he is saying you will know how much God has set you free if you practice grace. And by depending upon God, you will become mature. That's what he's saying. So you have to depend upon God. And you have to know how to walk with God. Obviously, you have to know, right? I was telling you in the 9 o'clock class, uh, class, a 9 o'clock service, that one of my flaws is I tend to run ahead of God. I'm 57 years old. Some of you are like, I can't believe you look old. Some of you are saying I'm a little, a little young. It doesn't really matter to me what you think, okay? But I just have to tell you, I'm 57 years old. I figured it out. Now, I haven't figured out how to like well, live for God. I figured out most of my life I run ahead of God. I get all excited. I, want, you know, I think I can do this. I run ahead of God. And the question I'm asking is how do I walk with God? And some of you run behind God, right? God's movement is, you, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't believe it. Right? You, you. And one of the questions, how do we walk with God? Well, here's verse 10. We are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus, do good work. Well, I think one of the things it's saying is that if you want to walk with God, one of the things you have to do is practice the discipline of grace. Well, how do you do it? So his movement is not so much like he's walking and you're racing and you're trying to, no, no, it's not that. It's actually a character. It's that which God calls us to do. And God calls his church to do this again and again and again and again and again because we are a part of an imperfect church. It's amazing. I've been doing ministry for near 30 years. And every year, every day, it requires more of my grace. I don't have it. So I got to live to him. And God is saying, keep in steps with me. Keep in steps with me. How, wow, Lord, by practicing grace. God, by giving grace to people that doesn't deserve it. Do it. And I'm like, I can't. Do it. I can't. Okay, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I walk in steps with the Lord. You know, some of you are like, you know, you're new, new here. You're like, we pray, pray on Tuesday, we pray on Friday, we pray on Sunday. Well, and you know, why, why do you guys, because we can't do it in our own strength. Because we're, we're, we're just not good. Oh, you're such a godly man. You pray several hours a day. No, no, no. It's because I'm ungodly. I don't have the power. It's not part of me. It's, part of, it's the Lord who gives it to me. The end goal is the cross. You know, for a believer, right? And we, we got this wrong because we don't have a good definition of grace, right? End goal is complete freedom to do that which that we know. End goal is the cross. 
Paul says at the end of his life, everyone has deserted me. Right? The end goal. Christ says, Eloi, Eloi, Labak Sabatani. End goal is to be completely lost without control. And you're like, well, I don't want that. Right? Uh, neither do I. But do you ever notice these people are set free? They're in gratitude. They're in contentment. Do you ever notice? It's just the complete opposite of what we think, right? We think like we got to go to like somewhere warm like Cancun. It's already hot. I met a couple of our members who went to Cancun last week. It rained every day. I was like, you could have stayed here. It didn't rain at all. It didn't rain till last night. And they're like, well, thanks for telling me hindsight. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasted all that money, but they didn't want to hear it. You know, maybe I was jealous. I don't know. You know, we, we, we go to somewhere warm, and then we drink that cool stuff. You know, they bring it to you, and we were like half empty, you know, outfit. And then we're like, oh, and then we can eat all you can eat, and then we'd be happy. No, no, no. Actually, it's the cross. <laughs> this is the paradox of the gospel, and this is the paradox of God's anointing. Because many of us, we, if we don't study the scripture co correctly, and if we're not part of a mature church, we think that God empowers us as we feel strong and as we get our way and as we achieve, right? We think that. In fact, we credit God for giving us all those things, hesed or blessing, to get there. The concept of going to the cross Ministering to those who doesn't deserve it, right? The concept of losing everyone at the end of your life. The, that concept is not part of American dream. We didn't sign up for us. This. Some of us who immigrated here, we didn't sign up for this. We didn't sign up for this. I had some people over at my house, and I, I have a pretty big house because uh, I bought a house, you know, foreclosed several years ago, whatever. But I was telling them about the gingerbread house I used to live in. I used to live in this house. It was 700 square feet, first floor and the second floor all put together. It was three steps from my kitchen to my, living, uh, my uh, dining room to the kitchen. It was like three large steps. I loved it. It had no insulation, so in the winter it was, hot, it was cold. In the summer it was hot. I mean, if I kind of think about it, right? No one is, like, working towards gingerbread house. Right? They want to like foreclose house, even if it's foreclosed and you got to fix everything. You, you, you want a bigger house, more space. You, every, see, this is the paradox. That's why church is supernatural. Because no human would make this. No human can make it. No man can make God's spiritual community. If that is true, then maybe God wants less of us and more of him. And that's why grace, discipline of grace, practicing, loving those, because we, none of us can do it very well. Maybe that's why the anointing comes through that. And maybe that's why we mature as we forego of ourselves and our flesh and look to Christ. I mean, it's hard, right? Is it not hard, right? We can't help it. When we look at each other, we look at our cultures, we look at our face, we look at our height, we get our built, we look at even the way we dress, what kind of clothes you had. I bought this wonderful shirt from Timu, and uh, I don't know if you guys know Timu. Um, you know, like if Amazon costs 20 bucks, Timu costs five. And because I'm cheap, right, I, I like this shirt. And of course, as soon as I wear it, every single member of my family tells me it looks bad. You know, but because I like cheap and I like, I, I, I really, you know, and I, I'm Korean. And it's, for, for a Korean, if you call a Korean cheap, they don't like that. That's an insult, okay? If you call a Chinese person cheap, they're like, thank you very much, okay? <laughs> All right? I'm just telling you, okay? But I'm Korean, and that's why my mom thinks I'm part Chinese. I'm like, I'm cheap, so I was wearing this shirt, and of course, my family's like, why are you wearing it? You know, it looks ridiculous, and whatever. so I, of course, I had to come on Friday and ask everybody else, and everybody else was fine. So I'm still, like, debating if I should keep wearing it, not wearing it, right? I mean, my daughter, like, first thing she says when she sees me, like, getting clothes from Timu is, Daddy, I'll take it. I, I think she's trying to protect me, but I'm like, no, no, I want this. It's, you know, I bought it. It's $5 I had to spend, right? That's how we look at each other. We measure everything. We, we judge everything. And all of a sudden, God is saying, no, 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 no. You are to be a loving community. Well, it's not full of loving people. You are to have gracious. It's not full of gracious people. You are to be what I commanded you to be. And automatically, we're like, well, how will we get there? Of course, the definition is like the way we get there is by our own strength, right? If we have loving people, caring people, then we would make it. So the church fails. Because there is none. 
There's no perfect people, perfectly loving people. I think Jensen Huang said this. He said, people with high expectations have low uh, resistance. When your expectation is so high, you have no, low resistance. You, you get disappointed all the time, right? Let me, let me tell you, if you want to build a gracious church, have a high expectation upon God and upon what God can do through you, not on people. Because you will always be disappointed. And your tolerance for disappointment goes down when you put people on pedestal. And I, I can say this because yesterday, you know, I don't know why they were talking about it. And Disciples 300 were talking about this, how many degrees certain people have. My wife has gone to school all her life. This is another question I never asked her why, okay? She still takes classes. Only thing I see is dollar signs, but she sees something else. I don't know what she sees. And so it doesn't matter how much education you get. It doesn't matter how much money you get. It doesn't matter how tall you are and how good looking you are and what color your hair is. And in my case, like how many strands of hair you have. It doesn't really matter. Your character is the same. In fact, I would say the good things really stand against it. Yet God calls us, right? God calls us wherever we are and says, hey, build a mature church. And one of the things he's reminding us is that here, here's one of the anointings that you need. You need to practice the discipline of grace because you need the anointing that comes through a discipline of grace. Because it will change you, it will make you grateful, and it will give you purpose in your life. You see it? We're asking the question, why? Because it will make a mature church. So we answer one more question. How? How do we practice discipline of grace? Let me give you three ways. One is by understanding that the practice of discipline of grace must be realized. Must, we must, to practice, we must realize that we are recipients of grace. It's, it's very simple, right? He made us, verse 5, he made us alive in Christ when we were dead in our transgressions, right? Verse 8, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? The repetition of verse 5, right? By grace you have been saved. And this not of yourself, it's a gift of God. This is a statement of power. Resurrection power. Right? You are dead. Right? The language is very clear. Verse 1, you are dead. You're alive. Well, I don't feel alive. Right? I feel 10 pounds overweight. I don't feel like it. Not, they're not asking you how you feel. It's giving you the spiritual reality of what God did in you. And you're like, well, how do I know? We already know that. Verse 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit that's sealed within you. He's going to be revealed when the redemption. You, you, Christ is going to come. And he's going to, if some of us are dead, he's going to resurrect us. And then the Holy Spirit within us is going to be revealed as a guarantee, a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance that we'll be co-heirs with Christ. He's not asking for your feelings. He's saying the reality of the truth of what God has done in your life. That you are a recipient and you, are, you're, you will inherit the kingdom with Christ. And he sends you his third person of a trinity, whether you fear or not, doesn't matter to God because he's alive. And he's reminding you that you've received grace. So if you want to practice the discipline of grace, you have to understand you're alive. You are co-heirs with Christ. You have a deposit of the Holy Spirit inside of you. In other words, you can't do it, so what? Because you have the deposit that's inside of it. You, you have to realize this. The grace that you received awakened you, quickened you. To come alive in a second by realizing that God anoints us when we practice the discipline of grace. This is the, this is the anointing that you have to trust, right? So, he, so he's saying, look, when you were saved, it was by faith. It wasn't by feeling, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You were saved through faith. In other words, you didn't feel it. You didn't even believe it. God gave you the ability to believe it. And when you believe that he saved you, you don't know how what it means to save. No, he saved you not by works, Right? Can no one, just as your salvation, when you practice grace, discipline and grace with one another, these anointings will come. God is faithful. He is telling you through his word. Just as he has quickened you, made you alive, he will anoint you. And you will get this these power, this ability that you've never had. That's what he's saying. Trust. Have faith. Faith saves you. Practice faith as you practice discipline of grace. And then one more by daily practicing discipline of grace through Christ, right? Verse 10, right? 
for we are God's handiwork. That's who we are. You look in the mirror, you're like, who, are, who am I? People are asking me all the time. In fact, I wrote a Discipleship 300, like 200 pages talking about who are we, right? Who am I? Well, here you are God's handiwork. He made you. In fact, the, the Psalms are, is very clear. David says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Whatever happened. Uh, yesterday I had, I had some friends over and there was a one-year-old baby, 16 months. And it's, it's amazing when I see a child, how much they are like their parents. Really, really amazing how, like, I think it's 80-20. So when I, before I had my children, I mean, both my kids look exactly alike to me. Okay, one has longer hair, the other one has, you know, shorter hair. But they always think that, you know, they look alike. Me and my wife look alike. I prayed, I prayed, God, God, I'm, I, I'm following you. Please, please, bless them. I, I, I pray for them, right? But God, he's saying, look, look, we are God's anyway. But he said, no, 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 not even when you're in the womb, Right? Creating Christ Jesus to do good work which God prepared in advance. I think what he's saying is that we are unstoppable. God's purpose in our life is unstoppable. It's not a merit base. And it's very important because you're like, I don't come from a graceful family. I'm from a dysfunctional home. You don't know what I've been through. My response, please don't tell me. You don't need to hear. I'm sure you've been through a lot, right? But you don't, you don't know. Oh, well, He's saying before the creation, I'm pretty sure that before the creation of the world, you were not there. Right? I'm pretty sure. Right? He says there God created, made you his, when he thought of you, he was going to create you, he gave you work. And one of the work that he gave you, and and when you you practice this work, giving grace to people that don't deserve it, and you practice this, you're going to know that you were created for a purpose. You know, like, um, you know, like, I went to an Indian restaurant this week, and my wife, I wanted to, like, have, my wife insisted on having lunch. I hate going out to eat, but she said, you know, it's my treat. So uh, in our house, um, we have money together, and then my wife has her own money. So she's like, I will, I will take you guys out. So I was like, oh, yeah, uh, let's go out. So we went to, and then I, of course, if I go for lunch, I just want Indian buffet because I, I think about, because I told you, I'm sorry, but I'm cheap. And I went there, and then they didn't have the buffet. And then I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, this is too expensive. So I'm like, I got up with my daughter. I'm like, we're not eating here. We we left. I said we might be back anyway, and because like it could be like ninety dollars. So I went, and then I, was, uh, I went to another restaurant, Karib Nawaz, which is uh, which is a much cheaper restaurant. And of course, I only paid third of it, and I was so proud of myself. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, here I am. Even though if it's it's my wife's money, I still save money. And then of course, she took a picture of me. I tell her all the time, don't please, don't post my picture on Facebook, but I can't control that, all right? She posts it, and, you know, and I, I, I eat the food, and then, you know. But we live in a world, inflation's high, right? Jobs are hard to come by. Houses are hard to buy, right? And we're like, what is my purpose? And let me just tell you, I'm old. So 20 years ago, when I first bought my house, it was hard. People are like, it's harder now. Yeah, I'm probably, 20 years later, it's probably harder, you know. But if you put your purpose in anything below, okay, being God's workmanship or handiwork, practicing grace with money, if you put, you, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna hit a wall. It's going to dry up. My son was asking me, um, Daddy, when will I bench 225 pounds? I told him, you're going to have to struggle at 185 for a while. And if you do it like 10 times, maybe you'll do it once, and then eventually you'll do it like five times. And if you do it like 8 to 10, then you'll get to 275, you'll do it once, and then you'll do it a while, and then you get 5 to 8, then you'll get to do 315. Then when you'll do it once, and then you do like 3 to 5, or 6 times, and you'll get to 365. I know because I did it. Okay? I understand that in every stage there is a plateau. Okay? So will you spiritually. There is a plateau. Okay? Certain people, it's hard to give grace. Certain stage of life, it's hard to practice grace. And then we get this illusion, right? We're like, we hit a plateau. We're not worth anything. No, no, you're still God's handiwork. He created it. Do you understand? You're set free. Before the creation of the world. You're not the standard. You are not the center. It's because of God. It's he made you before the creation of the world to be his handiwork. And the grace that you will practice and the anointing that you receive, most of it is not by you and your strength. 
Don't look in the mirror. Look up. Look up. Look up. How will I love my church? How will I love my friends? How will I love my family? Look up. He has all the love. He's the standard. He's the one who called you. He's the one who transformed you. He's the one who empowers you. He's the one who calls you and empowers you and enables you to do that which you could never do in your own strength. So let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you remind us again and again that we are called for your good work, the handiwork, the, the work of grace, the good work that you have called us to be. Make us your church. Your church, not our church. Your church that will practice grace with one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May we uh, continue our worship by uh, the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Uh, we can give on the app, we can give on Zelle, or we can give the physical offering uh, in the basket as it passes by. I ask if we can please stand as we continue our worship. Um. That we will be able to practice the discipline uh, of grace um, as we go throughout this week. Let's. Never said it would be easy. You never said there'd be no pain. But you promised you'd go with me. You promises you always keep. Sing, Lord, I confess how much I need you. And I confess how much I need you. I confess that I am weak. Can't promise I won't fail you, but your promises will not fail me. See, when I'm in the valley, when I'm in the valley.
can wash away my sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? standing as we receive the closing prayer. Let's pray together, Lord. We are so grateful for you and your anointing. We thank you that you have resurrected us, gave us resurrection power, and told us things, supernatural things, told us to do th supernatural things that are much less difficult than resurrection. Lord, make your community into a place of grace not only through your power, but through your power that flows through us to each other. So now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and fellowship of his Spirit be with this community now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. What's going on, you community? Good afternoon. Awesome. As you can see, I am not Phil, who usually gives the announcements. He is currently preaching at the Wicker Park campus. So let's get right into the announcements. Uh, this Friday is the last session of D300 Large Group, um, which leads actually into the next announcement, which is on Saturday, July 13th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the West Loop campus, which is here. Uh, we are going to be having our D Discipleship 300 retreat. Um, anyone who has already gone through Discipleship 300 in the past uh, is welcome to uh, come and join through uh, that retreat. Um, as we get into the 4th of July weekend holiday, there is no open prayer on Friday, July 5th. Um, but then July 7th, we will be having an all-campus worship and Independence Weekend barbecue and potluck here. So there will be no Wicker Park service. There will be uh, 9 a.m., and 11 a.m. service here at West Loop, and then we will continue having uh, fellowship with the 4th of July potluck. Uh, and then today, this afternoon, we have a, our next softball team practice. It will be at Humboldt Park at exactly 1.30. Uh, if you have any questions or need further details, please reach out to David Hong, who is in the back over there. Um, other than that, we meet on Tuesdays and Fridays for intercessory prayer and open prayer, respectively, from 6.30 to 7. So we hope to see you then. If not, we uh, hope to see you next Sunday. That is it. Thank you, guys. Have a great day and have a blessed week.